Once you have found it, would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father and glorious God, we want to give thanks to you. You are the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are the Father of glory. We would ask that you would give the Holy Spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of Christ to us that you might open up our eyes, the eyes of our heart to be enlightened, that we might know what is the hope to which you have called us, that we might know what are the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints. Lord God, we would ask that you would be with us to see Christ and him lifted up. We might know intimately the immeasurable greatness of your power toward us who believe according to the working of your great might, that you worked in Christ and you raised him from the dead. And Jesus, when you're seated at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, far above all authority, far above all power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also the one to come. Put everything under your feet now as we look at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Micah chapter 3 opens up a second section of judgment and salvation. You might consider this book the start of a second cycle of judgment and hope in the book of Micah. For today the Lord's words are heavy. This is not a section of scripture that you will find, uh, that you'll most likely hear at weddings or at coronations. You will not hear this scripture preached in most churches. Sadly, today, it won't make a top contemporary Christian hit song. It will not be picked up by Disney for a live animation. However, this is the word of God. And it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Micah was a prophet chosen by God to speak the word of God to the northern and southern tribes. Unfortunately, there was a, a split. And so, as we've been learning, these prophets were speaking to the people, telling them to turn from themselves and turn to the living God. In this chapter, Micah is speaking specifically to those in Jerusalem. So at this point in the history, at this point in our book, the Assyrians had actually besieged. They had invaded the northern kingdom. They overthrew the northern kingdom, or Israel. And many of them who survived fled south to Jerusalem as refugees. That time, in, in place, there was a king, and his name was King Hezekiah, who you're most likely familiar with, and he will be important a little bit later on in our chapter. Our text today actually gives us a look at three speeches from Micah himself. Three speeches. The first speech highlighted in verses 1 to 4 is an indictment and judgment sentence directed to the heads and civil rulers of Jacob and the house of Israel. The second speech we find in verses 5 to 7 and it is from Micah to false prophets. And if you're following the pattern, yes, more accusations and judgment. And the third speech, which we'll look at, verses 9 to 12, is to the leaders of Israel and Judah. Commentators suggest it happens in the temple during worship and brings the climax of judgment. We will not skip verse 8, but we'll focus on its significance as well. If you're able to stand for the reading of God's word, I would ask you to do that. At the very least, stand upright in heart as we hear. From Micah chapter 3. And I said, hear you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice? You who hate good and love the evil. Who tear the skin off of my people and their flesh from off their bones. Who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off of them. And break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot. Like flesh in a cauldron. Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer them. 
He will hide his face from them at that time because they have made their deeds evil. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore, it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced and the diviners put to shame. They shall cover all their lips for there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. Please be seated. Micah wants the readers to know that God is just and therefore cannot tolerate injustice. As the promise-keeping, covenant-keeping God, he is not passive. As his people, especially the leaders of his people, refuse to keep his law, refuse to keep his commands, refuse to keep the covenant, the leaders failed to lead the people into the inheritance of blessing and true peace. They failed to be the light of God's holiness and character to the nations around them. Rather than loving good, they loved evil. Rather than shepherding, they used and abused. Rather than leading God's way, they led astray. Rather than protecting, they destroyed. Micah 3 shows us that they would be held accountable to God. I want us to see two matters today. The first, the rejection of God leads to the absence of God. The Lord cannot be taken for granted. Rejection of his word, rejection of his people, rejection of his standard of morality, rejection of his justice, rejection of his goodness and his patience, rejection of his covenant and his salvation is to reject God himself, which is everlasting ruin. The second thing I want us to see, the second matter, is the purposes of God are fulfilled in Christ. The rejection of God leads to the absence of God. The purposes of God are fulfilled in Christ. Verse 1, And I said, that is Micah, hear or listen, you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. So if you have a good memory, you'll recall the use of hear back in chapter 1, which began the book. A call for God's people and all the earth to hear. And now again, and we'll have it again later. Hear, you heads of Jacob and rulers. So in this first speech, Micah has a word of judgment against judicial leaders. As mentioned, there was a king at that time. There was also civil officials. There were court systems. And they were to rule justly. They were to protect God's people. But they were corrupt. They became corrupt. They were turned in on themselves. And so Micah asks a rhetorical question, which he loves to do. Is it not for you to know justice? They absolutely were to know justice, but they were to know God's justice. They were also to know about God's justice. Not just in their minds. They were also to live it out and act it out. The meaning is to know not just in the mind, but in the heart. These were people that were set apart by God for a specific role. Similar to the governments that we have in the world now. Romans 13 says that they have been instituted, placed by God. And as citizens, we are to submit to them unto the Lord. They are to bring terror. Not if we have good conduct. Governments are to bring terror if, for those who have bad conduct. 
Some I desire to point out too much about our day, but Micah's day, that definitely wasn't the case. As you can see in the text, he addresses them. You who hate the good and love the evil. That's a scathing indictment. He's saying, you of all people, as God's people, civil leaders should know and act justly. To administer justice is to act fair and right according to God's standard. But they have their own preferences. Think about what's being said. They hated good and loved the evil. When we hate something, we don't go near it. We don't want to have anything to do with it. With it. it is repulsive to us. They were repulsed by God's goodness. When we love something, we want to be near it. They love the evil, Micah says. They hated good. They hated God's morality. And so what are the affections of your own heart? Are you drawn to what is good? Children, are you drawn to what is holy, what is acceptable, what is pleasing to God? Or are you inclined to the evil? Are you inclined to the sins and works and desires of the flesh? Romans 12.9 would imply that the Christian life should let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Years later, there was a prophet. His name was Ezekiel. And he was, a, he was a prophet to the exiled people at that time. And he would say this, Behold, the princes of Israel in you, every one according to his power, have been bent on shedding blood. This was the leadership. And that proves true as we see in the text. What did the rulers do? They're those who tear the skin off my people. And their flesh from off their bones, which is very graphic language. Let's continue, verse 3. Who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin off them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. If this was describing the wing night that I had with the Enses this week, I wouldn't be alarmed. That was a night of carnage, but it involved chicken wings on sale. Micah is saying here, you are the very leaders meant to protect and lead and help and shepherd and love my people. You're treating them like meat to be devoured. Ezekiel 34 says, you eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought. And with force and harshness you have ruled over them. The use of cannibalistic language by Micah is meant to shock people into repentance. It's meant to shock us. Micah is using strong verbs. Notice them. Tear, flay, break, chop. It's not literal, it's a metaphor to show they cannot continue to exploit God's people for their own personal gain. It's meant to contrast the type of ruling and shepherding with the true shepherd king of Micah 2, one who lays down his life and one who leads his people out of captivity. Consider now Jesus, who loves his people, who knows all that the Father has given him, and he will not lose one who promises to be with us to the end of the age and forevermore. That is a faithful ruler. That is a just king. So what can rulers expect from treating his people that way? Not great things. Verse 4. Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time. Why? Why? It says here, because they have made their deeds evil. 
So they profess to know God with their lips, but they deny him by their works. They are workers of lawlessness. And when the time comes, they will be faced with a calamity of their own. They will call out to God for help, and he will not be there. Because they failed to execute justice. Because they failed, they, they, they perverted the justice of God. They were, they were supposed to reflect and demonstrate this justice. Now God will deny them. And so I'm certain that they gave at many times. They certainly heard and recited the, the priestly blessing, the ironic blessing many times. But because they have made their ways evil, the Lord's face will not shine upon them. He will not give them peace. They have not acted justly, but they've rather acted wickedly. They didn't love and know justice. They ruled with injustice. The rejection of God leads to the absence of God. It's really a terrifying thought, the absence of God. They will be treated as harshly by God as they treated others, and worse. He will not answer. There is no help. There is no hope for them. This is calling, this is describing a calling of deep distress. Deep distress. There's no help and no help for them and not just for them. There will be no help for you if you reject Jesus Christ. There is no help for you. If you reject the gospel. If you reject the salvation of God on the day of your judgment, you will be cast out. And you might cry, Lord, Lord. And he will cause you to depart. Because he never knew you. Rulers and princes and leaders and people that sit in church. You can expect no blessing. Not listening to God. Not obeying God. Rejecting God. Not heeding the gospel. Those are many reasons for God not to listen to us. The prophet Isaiah spoke these words. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Let me remind you. God will fulfill his purposes in Christ. God's people, those who believe, can expect because of Jesus that he will hear and answer us. Have you thought about this? Because the Father turned his face away from the Son on the cross, from Jesus, the Lamb of God on the cross, because he bore the wrath and indignation of our sin, which we read about. He was crucified and was buried. Because Jesus rose from the grave. God will not. If we trust in Jesus for salvation alone, he will not hide his face. This one who is not guilty, who as the ESV Bible study note reminds us, he, Jesus, had every right to be heard by the Father through his life and conduct, but was not heard. Understand this then. No matter the wicked deeds that you have done. Jesus Christ is the true ruler. He is the true king that we all need. Do you know this? Christ is the best king. Because he rules over us and he defends us. And we need Christ as king because we are weak and helpless. fulfill his purposes in Christ. He's a better king. The second speech from Micah, as we pick it up in verse 5, it has a similar resemblance to the first, but sort of a new audience. Micah is speaking to now, and he's speaking to and concerning the prophets. 
false prophets. And what do they do? They lead people astray. Or as God says, they lead my people astray. How do they lead people astray? Well, they cry out peace when they have something to eat. But they declare war against him who puts nothing in their mouths. Mike is accusing the prophets of leading the, the people astray, but he's also accusing them of biting. They're using and abusing. They're cursing and targeting victims. The, the prophets were supposed to be giving revelation of God. They're supposed to be speaking true words from the Lord himself and about him. They preach good things, all right. They speak blessings from God when they're full and happy. Jeremiah 6, they have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. So if you didn't pay well, they waged war on you. If you didn't scratch their back, they wouldn't tickle your ears. They spoke according to the bribes that they received. They were influenced. And see, there's no place for mistreatment of God's people then or now. Not, not physically, not emotionally, not spiritually. And know this, he will by no means clear the guilty. He will all, hold all accountable. The prophets, the prophets should have been demanding that the crooked rulers repent. But they were only prophets for pay. Prophets for hire. Not much has changed for some preachers of God's word. All over the world, men and women claim to be prophets of God. And they will bless you all day long if you pay them. The problem is, no matter how much guilt the prophet with the private jet lays on you, no matter how much you pay or support, you cannot buy forgiveness. You cannot buy favor with God. God will not be bought or sold. And he certainly won't be mocked. God's people have always needed the word of God to guide them. They needed it then from the prophets. We need it now from the word of God and the Holy Spirit. We need it as a lamp and a light to our feet and our path. Nothing more and nothing less. And so if you're teaching in the church, teach God's word. If you're preaching in a church, preach only God's word. It's the only thing lacking and it's the only thing needed. If you're in any kind of ministry at all, for filthy lucre, if you love money, or you love the applause that comes from men or fame and position, if you love power or authority, and if you peddle God's word for greedy purposes, you need to repent and quit. Step down and run far away from those temptations because they will destroy you and destroy others. The abominations that happen at the Third Day Victory Church, not far from us, are leading people astray. And the leaders of that church need to repent. Just months ago, they declared miracles. They declared victory over a lady who had cancer. They spoke and they promised that God would heal. They, they commanded it. And she died two weeks later. Please pray for the faithful preaching of God's pure word in every pulpit and in every church. And please pray for repentance. What happens if 
We don't do this. What happens? Well, what happened to the profiters for hire? Verse 6. Therefore it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you without divination. The rejection of God here, rejection of his word and duty to speak it as we ought will lead to the absence of God. They won't have visions to speak of. Complete darkness. No visions from God in those times. No prophetic word. To have no prophetic word then means it meant judgment. There will be no revelation. The sun will go down on the prophets and the day shall be black over them. Verse 7, the seers, they were er, what we called early prophets. They, they shall be disgraced. The diviners put to shame. They will be ashamed. Micah's attacking here. And he's announcing just retribution by God himself on the false prophets. Much like Amos when he warned that God was going to send famine on the land. Are you familiar with this? But not a famine of bread or thirst, but a famine of hearing words of the Lord. The rejection of God leads to the absence of God. They, they shall cover their lips. It's sort of interesting. Leviticus speaks of those who are, who are spiritually unclean, uh, even those with leprosy. They had to actually cover their lips. Literally, it means they had to cover their mustache. And they had to declare, unclean, unclean. That's the thought. One preacher suggested the prophets have now become spiritual lepers. They're unfit, unclean, unqualified. They're ashamed. They're disgraced. They're abandoned in darkness because there's no answer from God. They are now useless. So what kind of preacher, what kind of preaching do you prefer? What kind of words do you like to hear? I think this text would ask, would ask us those heart-probing questions. Do we love God's trustworthy word as taught? Do we love God's word? Parents, are we, are we leading our children according to God's word? Men, are, are you leading your wives according to God's word? Young men, are, are you training yourself in the word of God to, to do this with your own family one day? Young women... Are you praying for a husband that loves the word of God and looks like it? You can start now. Let me remind you, the purposes of God are fulfilled in Christ. We need his word. He has given us everything that we need for a life of holiness and godliness. His word, it has authority. It has comfort. God's word has guidance. It is the truth. And his word actually became flesh. And he himself, Jesus, is the way, the truth, and the life. And so Jesus Christ is the prophet that you and I need. Because why? We're ignorant to the word of God. And he is the word of God, a perfect prophet who gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Verse 8 acts sort of as a hinge between speeches now. It's meant to show us that Micah is unlike the false prophets or the false leaders who were driven by greed and selfishness. Who were cowards and liars. Who, who did not give the people what they needed, but they took and used God's word to get what they wanted. So, so it says here, but as for me, says Micah, I am filled with power with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgressions and to Israel his sin. So this is what a true prophet looks like. This is what a true prophet does. Micah is described as having four things. Please notice, Micah is filled with the power to declare God's word. Power to declare God's word. This is God's power. The same power that Paul says in Ephesians that God gave him to be a minister of the gospel. The same power that we need when sharing the gospel. We are not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. Micah is, a, Micah is a prophet also, notice, that is filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing good in God's eyes. 
how we need the Holy Spirit to speak the truth. The people in the book of Acts, they are described as being filled with the Spirit of the Lord. And in every single time, what follows that is gospel proclamation. Mike is also filled with justice. He is able to speak to and speaks and does what is right. He doesn't have to do what's easiest, but he does what's right according to God. You could say he prays the prayer, he talks the talk, and he walks the walk. He's not swayed. He cannot be bought because he's been taught by the Lord. And finally, Micah is filled with might. Micah is filled with might. He's filled with boldness and courage. As one person said, he is not influenced by fear or favor. He fears the Lord and not man. These are marks of a true prophet. And these are reflections of God's perfect and good character. And those are displayed most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, I thought a lot about the need to speak God's truth in the world. People are being led astray by the corrupt messages of our time. Children, well, the world would say they're a nuisance, so they can just be destroyed. The world says older people are a hassle and useless, so they can just walk into a doctor's office one afternoon and not walk out. The world says that people can just decide that they are not who God made them in his image. The world's message that God making male and female doesn't matter, that you can just take hormones and lop off body parts. Or that every diagnosis needs more pills. Or mental illness is never sin, but someone else's fault. And every adulterous heart can just abandon a marriage or a family if it wants to and feels like it. That God can be ignored and rejected and pushed aside. And everyone can become their own God. And just do whatever is right in their own eyes. There's no justice. There's no order. And so we as God's people need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with justice. We need to be filled with might. We need to be filled with power to declare the truth of God's judgment and his salvation in Christ alone. This is a much needed prayer for us all. And as we will see in the third speech as well, it was needed for Micah. He was going to confront some people one more time. And again, it's believed that this happened in the temple during worship in Jerusalem. When no one else would, he alone would declare their transgressions and sins. Do you think he could have done that on his own? Verse 9. Again, hear this. You heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. Nearly the same as verse 1. Micah summarizes again the words of judgment on the courts and government, the prophets and the priesthood in this section, in his speech. Those leaders who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight. Without justice, there is, no, there is just chaos. God himself is a God of order. When it comes to matters of the heart, only the Lord is truly able to make something straight when it's crooked. They have bent things beyond straight, beyond repair for themselves. Mike is accusing them of building Zion with blood and iniquity. Do you see that? And so there was the threat of Assyrian invasion at that time. You can read about this in Kings and Chronicles. They already went through northern part, the northern kingdom. And now the city was swelled with people that were sort of hunkering down. So King Hezekiah was preparing for the, the incoming invasion. 
And so what happened was, Jerusalem at that time, they, they built a bunch of big projects. You can read about those in Second Chronicles 32. Um, they, they, they had to build a broad wall and a tunnel so that they could get water to other parts of the city. It was a pretty big deal. And, and Second Chronicles actually records that thousands of man hours and labor was, was used to move all that rock. So the Lord knows how many people died for this work. They weren't seeking his face. The Lord knows what kind of blood was spilled. His lives were just a commodity used for unjust gain. You know, it's one thing to defend yourself. But, but Mike is pointing us to it. The, they were guilty of their own undoing. Verse 11 shows us how that was. They give judgment for a bribe. The priests were given over to greed. And they taught for a price. And pro prophets practiced divination, which was actually a banned practice. It was wrong practice, according to the Lord. They also sold out and did all that for money. Boyce says this, What troubled Micah and God far more was the sin in the courts, palaces, and temple. All three branches of government were corrupt. Worse yet, they worked hand in hand. The politicians got their way in the courts, and the judges were paid for the destruction of justice. The prophets also benefited from this arrangement and supported the government in turn. If the whole corrupt governing and ruling system wasn't enough, they also wrongly assumed that the Lord would be with them. They took great pride in idolatry of the temple and their, their positions of power and status. And they would shed blood to keep it. They became so crooked. Their transgressions were so great. They must have forgotten what the Lord said. After Solomon finished building that very temple, it's recorded in 1 Kings, If you turn aside from following me, you or your children, and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them, and the house which I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight, and this house will become a heap of ruins. Everyone passing by it will be astonished, and they will hiss, and they will say, Why has the Lord done this to the land and to this house? Sins of presumption were not tolerated. What does that have to do with us? Another commentator summarized it better than I could. This is a warning to people today who rely on their church membership to grant them God's favor. Apart from a living and obedient faith, it warns Christian youths who go along with their parents to church and observe an outward faith but engage in no true discipleship to Jesus Christ. It's a warning to nations such as America or ours, which assumes God's favor because of past spiritual achievements, yet now embraces the grossest perversions and the most despicable sins. Most of all, it is a warning to churches that observe Christian traditions, but neither teach true doctrine nor promote godly living. So we have to guard our minds and hearts from this thinking. Let's be encouraged to show our faith to show that we trust the Lord by seeking to keep his commandments. To seeking to obey his word. And when we fail, which we will, ask the Lord to grant us repentance. True repentance. Instead of persisting in, in sinful ways. Philip Ryken helps us. God has saved you from sin, not for sin. If you are unrepentant about lust, bitterness, greed, anxiety, or any sin whatsoever, you are presuming upon God's grace. And for the unbeliever, this is also a warning for you. When it comes to the Lord's patience, you also cannot presume. Today there is mercy and grace in Jesus Christ. God fulfills his purposes in Christ. As we have heard, you were ignorant. But he's a great prophet. 
and he is the word and life that you need. You, you are weak and helpless in your sins and, and you're separated from God. He is the ruler and king that protects us and defends us and redeems us. The shepherd king who loves with an undying love. You also have sinned. You have sinned against the holy God. You are condemned. And yet, Jesus is a great high priest who offered himself as an atoning sacrifice. If you believe, the blood of Christ can make you clean. He can bring you back to God. He has shown steadfast love and has been faithful to grant you many days, many years. But you call upon his name before it's too late. He will never turn away any who cry out to him for forgiveness. Maybe you've never heard that. He can and will save you from the wrath of God and eternal judgment. The gate is open. But one day it will close. The rejection of God leads to the absence of God and utter darkness for you with no second chance. Don't presume on his patience. Come to him in repentance. Cry out that the Lord would grant you faith in Jesus Christ and rescue you transfer you from the dominion and domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, the kingdom of light. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He's abounding in steadfast love. He's full of mercy. Imagine the scene as we begin to close. Imagine the scene as Micah stood up in the temple and he spoke words that the leaders thought was unbelievable. They, they never thought this would happen. They never imagined that the temple would fall. Much like in Jesus' day when the temple and place of worship was idolized and worshipped. They thought it was crazy when he said, uh, de destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. He did build a new temple. He rose from the grave. And he is the cornerstone of a temple that can never be destroyed. Do you know that by believing and belonging to Christ you are also living stones built up into a spiritual house? Don't take my word for it. Read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. As Micah said, in the power of the Lord filled with the Holy Spirit, therefore because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house of the Lord a, a wooded height. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen awake in vain. The rejection of God leads to the absence of God. It would all be destroyed. In this case, it actually wouldn't happen until years later when the Babylonians would come and burn it all down. And they would carry God's people away into exile. So what happened now? Assuming, assuming they're right at the gates. What happened? Well, Micah's words are actually recorded a little bit later in Jeremiah. Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was basically about to be put to death for speaking the same words as Micah spoke in the same way to unrepentant leaders and officials. And some people recognized the third speech from Micah. And Jeremiah's life was spared. Jeremiah 26. And what happened was the Assyrians never succeeded in invading Jerusalem. It was not the Assyrians. The angel of the Lord killed thousands when they tried. You can read about that. The Lord protected them. We could say here, and this is wonderful hope in a dark chapter, King Hezekiah repented. I thought about how remarkable that is. Micah. One guy filled with the Spirit of the Lord, 
was able to induce repentance when it looked like all was lost, how much more? How much more could an entire New Testament church, how much could we see the Lord do if we repented? If we sought his face? If we prayed for our country? If we prayed that the Lord's name would be hallowed? If we spoke the gospel with boldness and courage that comes from the Holy Spirit, it's not of us. What what would it look like if we knew God's justice and lived like that? just saw what one guy can do. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. May it be so. And may we trust that in judgment and in salvation, God fulfills his purposes in Christ. Please stand. Dora's just acting. She's actually not going to play this one. We're going to sing a cappella. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. 